This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Music is a very personal thing. Some love the music they grew up with. Others completely shun the music that reminds them of their past because they have become more serious about their faith. Still others listen to music that only comes from believers in Messiah. But there's something deeper going on in all forms of music, something almost no one recognizes. But tonight, we have an expert on the subject because he was part of it all. We're talking to him tonight because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Music, as you probably know, is a very spiritual thing. Make no mistake about it. In fact, our guest tonight is Alan Aguirre. He is the author of a new book called This Thing is Spiritual, this thing being music. It's, it's all about music. And I think you'll be very surprised what he has to say about certain forms of music. And you'll be very surprised about where he has seen the Holy Spirit show up during his musical career. Uh, early this week we crossed over into the new month of Shabbat and this is the first Shabbat of that month on the astronomically and agriculturally corrected biblical Hebrew calendar. You can see it on your screen there. And uh, we are actually now taking pre-orders for our new 2019-2020 calendar. And that features photos from Mount Sinai itself, the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, taken by Andrew Jones. These photos will bring a tear to your eye as many of these photos are a first of their kind in the world. No one has ever taken photos like this. You'll be amazed. Uh, another world first is something we want to talk about with my co-host tonight. He is the Chief Operating Officer of Rude Awakening International. Please welcome Ted Clayton. Well, thank you, Scott. Appreciate it for being here today. Now, Ted, before we get into anything here that's, that's on the desk, I know you wanted to say something to the folks at home. Yeah, you know, I really did. Uh, today is the second week in January, and I just wanted to say thank you, thank you to all of our partners, our Ambassador Club members, our executive producers, everyone who has given uh, their best. And I just want to say how much we appreciate it, how much we appreciate everything uh, that you have given up until this point. We're going to do some amazing things in 2019. We're going to uh, take the chronological gospel to languages like French, uh, to Chinese, and we're going to be taking the chronological gospels and the message of Yeshua all over the world. So I, before we started, I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone that gave in our year-end campaign. All right, and speaking of those uh, those manuscripts of the chronological gospel, yes. they're just going to, you mentioned uh, French, Spanish, uh, Chinese, and there's one, oh, Russia, Russia. is the fourth yes. one, mm -hmm. fourth one. And uh, those are what we were doing last month for a gift of $1,000 or more. Michael was right. going to give one of those precious manuscripts that we have left yes. uh, signed by him, and I believe we actually have a few left, and if, if folks called, I'm sure we could still. If you call today, you can get one. Oh, oh, there you go, there's the confirmation. Uh, and you can just call our regular number, 888-766-3610. Now yes. something else special we're doing for January uh, is something for folks in Israel. Yes. Uh, we know that in Israel, there's uh, as often as it rains maybe here in America, it's raining down rockets down in places like Starot and Ashkelon. You know, Scott, when people hear the sirens go off in Israel, mm -hmm. and by the way, I have a little app called the Red Alert app that I keep on my phone all the time. It reminds me of what's happening in Israel. That thing goes off constantly, mm. and every time it goes off, people only have 15 seconds to get into a bomb shelter. But what if there's no bomb shelter available? And that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And I know that we have uh, helped to take something here that was meant for harm, but actually turned into beauty with uh, these beautiful roses. I believe it was uh, Yer uh, Yaron Bob. Yeah, that's his uh, name. Uh, yep. Actually handcrafted each and every one of these things special. And they are just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they have uh, the, the, the entire country of Israel carved out of the bottom. And every one of these 
were made out of rockets that were intended to destroy people's lives, but instead they're now being uh, they're now being saved by these bomb shelters. Yeah, isn't it amazing? And these bomb shelters, uh, as we mentioned last week, uh, are portable. Yeah, I don't know how you make a portable bomb shelter, but for a place <laughs> like Ashkelon, that is a wonderful thing. Uh, in fact, that's what these sculptures are being made for, yes. specifically for bomb shelters in Ashkelon. And uh, this month, as last month the uh, the manuscripts were a thousand, mm-hmm. uh, we had folks saying, "Hey, do you have something a little more affordable? I can't quite afford sure. that, but I'd sure, sure like to help out." And so that's why we did this. It's two hundred and fifty. Which yeah. is really quite a, quite a, a great thing to have in your home. Well, realistically, it's it's honestly just above cost. Mm. But we wanted to get these out. And listen, folks, people need uh, ways to break the ice about Yeshua Messiah to other folks. This is a perfect opportunity to have something that you can talk about when they say, oh, look at this. What is this about? This looks so pretty. And then you can actually get into the conversation saying, well, it just so happens that this has made a bomb shelter for folks in Israel, and then you can start sharing your faith. Unbelie- yes, wonderful thing. And, and uh, again, it's only uh, only for January, actually. Right. So we're doing this from January 1st uh, through the 31st, so there's just roughly 20 days left to do this. And only with as supplies last, yes. because we don't have hundreds of these, we only have a few. So as supplies last, we'll be able to send these out. Indeed, now you can get there very easily by going to arudeawakening.tv slash rose, and it's as simple as that. You'll yeah. also find them on our regular store. We wanted to make it nice and easy for you to find. Yeah. Uh, also easy for you to find is this month's glove gift by going to monthlylovegift.com. Now yeah. this is Michael's uh, continuation of his Acts series. Yes. Uh, and, and the cover of this, uh, this particular teaching, as you can see here, Ted, it's, it's got a fork in the road. Yeah. And this is where Paul, uh, Paul and Barnabas were challenging people. Okay, folks, it's time. Are you gonna choose what we're saying to you about Yeshua, or are you gonna choose the way of the Pharisees? It's yeah. time to decide. Yes. And people had to be, as the title suggests, unafraid yes. uh, to go with Paul and Barnabas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and go their way. And so that's what this teaching is all about and, and the struggles that people had. And it's a wonderful teaching by Michael. Mm-hmm. And of course, we always want to include a, a gift with this. So uh, this is actually Michael's gift to you for a right. donation of $50 or more. But if you'd like to give a little more, say 100 or so, you can get the teaching and this mezuzah. Now the mezuzah, we hang on the doorpost. It, it, you know, it's wonderful. Uh, you know, mezuzahs are things that uh, mezuzahs are things that every home should have. You want the protection of the Almighty to, to dwell in your home. And what a wonderful way, but to bring the Torah into the home. Right, literally, yes, because the Torah is inside this wooden piece. It's only about, oh, maybe a- Very thin. Uh, yeah, about a mm-hmm. half an inch thick. But inside, they've carved out an area where they have a tiny scroll of Deuteronomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, inside here, and they, they've covered it up with some felt and, and glued it in. So you, you don't take it out, but it, it's in there. And uh, it says, Shaddai Yerushalayim. So basically, uh, the power of God looking over Jerusalem, and it's again, it's in the shape of Israel. And it's made out of olive wood from the Holy Land. Yes, it is, yeah, and olive wood has all kinds of uh, symbolism in scripture, yeah. and it's a wonderful thing as a reminder too that uh, even if you're not feel like you're part of Israel, you're not Jewish, but you're Christian, well, you are part of the commonwealth of Israel. And uh, the olive tree is a perfect example of that because we are the wild branch, of course, grafted in. Grafted in. So you can get that by going month to monthlylovegift.com. Now, uh, coming up, the fourth and final interview with Alan Aguirre, author of This Thing is Spiritual. It's all about the influence of music on your spirit. But first, if you like what you're seeing tonight and appreciate what A Rude Awakening is bringing to your life, we invite you to stand with us. Help us to reach others. Our love gift is the best way to do that. Here's some more information on how you can do that. The lines are further drawn between the Pharisees and the new followers of Yeshua. It's time for the apostles to decide whether to continue to follow Yeshua down an unknown path or revert back to the man-made Pharisaical law under which mankind is always destined to fall short. The scriptures say that we are to pray for kings and all in authority. So this is what Shaul says, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness, in honesty, because God desires all men to be saved, to be made whole, and come to a knowledge of the truth. In this month's dynamic love gift teaching, Unafraid is a message about fighting for our faith, no matter what the Pharisees in our own lives are threatening. When you are ordained, this is the prophetic anointing that was put on you. These are the prophecies by way of the Holy Spirit that you might war a good, a commendable warfare. 
you were ordained as a warrior, a dedicated Hanukkah warrior. Unafraid is an exclusive teaching available only in January. It's a gift from Michael Rood to you for your love gift donation of just $50. Or with a love gift donation of $100 or more, we'll send you Unafraid plus an eight inch olive wood mezuzah. Hang the mezuzah in your doorway as a reminder to live your life unafraid as a member of God's family, Israel. Get Unafraid and the Olive Wood Mezuzah as a thank you gift from Michael Rood. In the book of Acts is what's going on today. That's why I waited my entire life to be able to share these things because this is where we are. We are in the book of Acts, ladies and gentlemen, and that's why you've gotta get this message out to people. Call to make your love gift donation now, 800-788-7887, or visit our website at monthlylovegift.com. Hurry, this exclusive offer ends January 31st. The composite of the gospel records tell us that before the Passover lamb was sacrificed the following morning, that Yeshua had his last supper with his disciples, in which he took bread, artone, leavened bread, and he took wine, and he said, this represents my body which will be broken for you. This cup represents my shed blood which will pay for the iniquity. It is this very thing that the Melanxotic shared with Abraham. As Yeshua said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. And when the Melanxotic brought forth bread and wine, he shared with them about the coming of the Messiah, about his broken body, about his shed blood. And Abraham gave a tenth of everything that he owned and laid it at the feet of the Melanxotic. He saw Yeshua's day and he rejoiced. And so now, every time we do this, every Sabbath, every meal in which there's bread and wine, in which we take this and we bless the Most High, Baruch Atah Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Yeshua said, this is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And then Yeshua took the cup and he said, blessed are you, Yahovah, our Elohim, king of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine, the creator of the fruit of the vine. And every time we do this, we do remember his death and what he did for us until he comes. One day at the marriage supper of the lamb, Yeshua will lift his cup and say, I have not had a drop of this as I promised at the last supper. I've been waiting for you. Now, Laheim to life everlasting. For the last several weeks on Shabbat Night Live, we've been speaking with Alan Aguirre, the author of The Feasts Unlocked, and Alan would like to give you a gift. Uh, it's 15% off if you go to planetbluemedia.com and enter the code RUD15, and that can be yours. It's a fascinating book. Alan, we've been talking about this for the last few weeks. Uh, thank you for coming back. My, absolutely, my pleasure. You know, you mentioned to me that uh, this is not the only book you've got going on. You've got, what, two, three others in the works? Is there... <laughs> Something like that. So okay. um, I'm presently working on a, on a book called This Thing is Spiritual. Yes. It's about the spirituality of music. Okay. And then this is kind of like one of three. The Feast Unlocked roughly covers the 40 years in the desert. Mm -hmm. The next book is Identity Crisis, uh, Circumcising Your Egyptian Slave Mentality. And it's Joshua chapter five. It's on the banks of the Jordan. It's prior to actually going in and conquering the land of Canaan. Okay. And then the third one is the actual conquest, possession of the land of Canaan. Uh, and it's called G6. And it's, they, they, you know, they, they enter the land to possess it and, oh no, there's giants here and now what? So now so. you started this whole thing, uh, this thing is spiritual. Uh, back when you were a kid, you were a musician. What was yeah. the first inter instrument you played? How old were you? Uh, well, I'm a drummer. First and foremost, I was a drummer. Uh, something really interesting, I was seven years old and we used to take uh, drive vacations. Like you know, my, my dad used to race cars, so he liked to drive. Mm -hmm. So I remember I'm from Los Angeles, so we drove up to San Francisco and we were, I was like seven years old and we were at a lighthouse 
and there's a lighthouse and the grounds of the lighthouse was like a park and there's people picnicking and throwing frisbees and all this. And so I asked my mom, I mean, what's so important about this lighthouse that, you know, not only are all these people here, but we're here too. She goes, oh, well, he's famous, whoever this lighthouse owner was. Oh. He's famous. And I remember looking at her and going, I want to be famous. And something entered me when I said those words. That's not a good thing. <laughs> you don't want foreign objects entering you. But when I said the words, when I, when I declared, I want to be famous, something entered me. I would not know what that was for a few, you know, for a few years after getting saved and realizing what it was that had entered me. Mm. Um, and so I wanted to be famous, apparently, and, uh, and I knew that it was going to be music. Um, I pursued music from then on, and I was playing professionally by the time I was like 12 or 13 uh, in bands. I was looking at my first secular record deal at the age of 15. Really? Yes, and that's when my parents decided this isn't good. Not that they knew what they were doing, but this isn't good, and they sent me to live with a missionary uncle in Central America under false pretenses. And I would end up getting saved there and, and all that. So, yeah. But music never left you because you no. had a career after that. Right, so I got saved and now uh, it was, uh, I, you know, what does the Bible say about uh, a musician that's a believer in, in, in God? And you, 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 you look in the Bible and there's the tabernacle of David, there's David, there's prophets, uh, there's um, the Levitical priesthood. And so, and, and, and what I was reading in, 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 the, in the biblical narrative is, these musicians that are doing music for God are actually functioning as oracles. They're functioning as a bridge between man and, and the supernatural. And they're bringing God down on the people. Hmm. Uh, and you know, he inhabits our praise. And the prophets were using music to, as an oracle to, to get a word from the, from the Holy Spirit. And there's, there's other attributes to this. You know, there's healing, there's miracles, there's, there's the supernatural. And so that started my trek on being a prophetic worship leader. And I remember the first time I played music as a, as a, as a Christian at my uncle's church, he, uh, I was gonna you know, play drums since that was my primary instrument. I mean, I, knew, I played guitar and I was a singer songwriter and all that by, by this time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he, he, there was a poster on our wall and he said, see that thin white line border around the picture? That's you on the drums, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <he's trying> to, <laughs> <laughs> and and um, so I would play drum, and I, I became a very a prophetic drummer. Uh, what I mean by that is, the Holy Spirit would come down, be, based on my drumming, mm. and and so learning the mechanics of that, of how how music will and can and should at this, you know, as a believer, uh, evoke the Holy Spirit or provoke the Holy Spirit, bring the Holy Spirit down, uh, that connection, that intersection with the supernatural. And that's a very powerful sword to wield. And it's biblical. We've got lots of uh, examples of this gifting, calming evil spirits or, you know, doing that type of stuff. And that's, that's, that's insane when you think about it. Hmm. Well, they, when the saying comes, uh, music soothes a savage beast. Right. I really actually believe that music is a component of, one of the, the most important components of our humanity in connection with, with, the, with the Father. Um, historically, we see that as well. And imagine my surprise uh, of having this ability and this gift that to me was, you know, a way to get chicks and uh, money, <laughs> you know, rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, that this is actually, that there's actually something way huge, way bigger than that behind it and that I had this ability and this gift. So aligning myself with that was, um, you know, very exciting. And um, yeah, I was involved in the Christian music scene. At the, at, uh, I started doing that at the age of 19 when I first got back to the States. I started a band that um, took off and so I, yeah, I've spent most of my, my life being a, a touring, you know, recording artist in the Christian music industry, and well, if anybody ever doubts the the spirituality of music, let's not look, forget to look on the other side. I mean, there is a connection with Lucifer and yeah. music, yeah, and you know, so so then obviously, uh, and I mean this uh, facetiously, uh, if you went 
Christian music, everything must have been sunshine and roses. Oh yeah, <laughs> unicorns and rainbows. And rainbows, so um, tell us about the rainbows. Yeah, I'll tell you about the rainbows. There's a, the Christian music industry is just as compromised as the secular music industry. Mm. It's an industry, it's a, it's a money-making machine. The gospel is a market, not a ministry. It's, you know, there was a time I remember when uh, your, your radio success would be based on JPMs. How many Jesus is per minute are you saying, you know, how many times do you say Jesus in a minute in your song is going to help with your, your, record, your song placement when it comes to being played on radio stations. You can't be serious. I am absolutely serious. Really? Yes. Wow. JPM, There's a, there was a term for it. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's this, this kid that came out of a, a very charismatic, uh, background being thrusted into Christian Bible studies in the U.S. and where there was no God. Now I'm in the Christian music industry and there's no God. <laughs> and it's you know it's I mean yes there are exceptions to the rules obviously, but the vast majority the the majority it's just it's a, it's it's easier for a lot of these bands to be a Christian band than it is to be a band band. Mm. Right, so they're gonna, you know, there's there's that aspect of it too. Gotcha. So now you mentioned earlier that when you played the drums, you felt, you know, the Holy Spirit oh. guiding you and, and coming down. And there's a, is there a responsibility you feel as a musician to bring others into worship through your instrument, whether that's your voice or, or right. something you're holding? I see real Christian music being the music that provokes evokes, whatever word we want to use, that actually brings God down over his people in order for his people to be in his presence and to be even more transformed into the likeness of his son. And that's going to also involve the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, whether it be healing, deliverance, um, hmm. so, prophetic, so, whatever. So music then to you is a very important aspect of it's, delivering people. It, and, uh, I, well, yeah, I, well, one, I, we have that example in the Bible. Two, I've been actively involved with that for over 30 years, and it's a very powerful tool. Uh, we have played secular clubs. Uh, there's a, uh, I think it was 2002, 2003, we were playing, uh, it, it was my, I had a dark wave, kind of edgy new wave band, melodic. Uh, we were playing a, a, a lesbian bar in lower Manhattan, and you know, when, when the Holy Spirit is part of the writing team, he shows up as soon as you start playing that song, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're doing our thing, and God shows up at this bar, and it's really powerful, and we're doing our thing, you know, 35 minutes set or whatever, and a line formed af as we were getting our gear to move. It's like a cattle call, right? Mm -hmm. You wait for the band to finish, you throw, get your stuff up there, do your thing, and then you gotta strike the stage because here comes another band, right? So it's like this crazy thing. So as we're trying, you know, as we're getting our, our gear off stage, there's a line forming, uh, all these, you know, guys and girls wondering what the heck just happened? What did you just do to us? What was that power? What was that, you know, you're a witch or you're a warlock. I've heard that a gazillion times. You're a warlock. You know, what is this? And it's, it was, you know, the Holy Spirit. And I, and I explained to him, you know, because I, 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 of course I like, teasing them, right? It's like, you know that Jesus that you hate? That's what just happened. That's what you just encountered. That's what just entered into your space hmm. and you have no idea what it is. It's Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, that Christian Jesus guy. So what was the result of that? Did you, did you have any uh, longer conversations with people in no, that situation? No, it's, 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 like, it's like in and out, right? But ah. you, just, you just tell them what it is and you wow. do what you can right then and there as far as praying for them or talking them through it all and all that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, now with our prophetic worship band, ministrieswalking.net, um, <laughs> <laughs> our prophetic worship band, Ministries Walking, there, that's, um, that's a deliberate, we're coming here to do this and to spend time with you and walk you through the process and, and, and that ministry aspect of it. Now tell me about the, uh, the objective The objective. Nashville. So a friend of mine and I do a thing, it's a conference in Nashville called The Objective. Uh, it has about, oh, now it's about six, we've been doing it for over 10 years, six or 700 un, uh, brand new, you know, they're, they're new artists, they're unsigned, um, you know, they're, they're new, they're a lot of new artists. And 
essentially, they, it's a conference that we throw. We have a bunch of you know mentors involved. Uh, Michael W. Smith shows up on occasion. We've had you know people of that caliber in Nashville show up. We are the, the objective. Of the objective is to try and intercept these young artists who are convinced that they're supposed to have a seat at the table uh, in Christian rock or whatever. Uh, the vast majority of them are believers and of every level and denominational background that you can imagine. And they want to be Christian, you know, the next whatever, name your favorite Christian rock band. And what they don't understand, is, and most people don't understand, is the desire for that is, is that's, it's, the, it's the root of the pride of life. And the enemy is literally waiting to destroy you and your marriage and your life and your faith, your walk, you know. Uh, not a lot of bands have made that have have have, succe- uh, have uh, survived that process of going huge and keeping their faith intact. Uh, one of my friends, uh, good friends, the singer for P.O.D. Sonny, has done a, a great job of raising his family in the Lord and keeping the faith and growing in his faith. Uh, it's 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 rad, and um, so we try to intercept these bands. And the objective of the objective is to somehow instill this understanding in these young bands, these young artists, that the objective, your objective should be, first and foremost, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because if they can hang on to that, if they can keep that perspective, and if it is God's will that they're supposed to be doing this, um, that's going to take them a long way. That's going to go a long way. Because there's, again, I mean, it's... There's a lot of witchcraft involved in the entertainment industry. Obviously, that's a, that's, that's no that's no surprise to anyone, even to those that may not even believe in witchcraft. Mm-hmm. This is like a real thing, and these young bands are really interested in going there, and they don't necessarily know what it is that they're wanting or getting involved with. Mm-hmm. And so we try to, you know, and we and we have there's mentoring sessions, and um, so about five years ago, six years ago, I was it was my turn to speak at this particular. Uh, this particular year, uh, I decided to talk on, it was called This Thing is Spiritual. And it was the spiritual aspect. Everything we just said, the spiritual act- aspect of music, uh, what it says about it in the Bible, the, the, and, and how the, the spiritual gifts and the prophetic all tie into it. And I was into it three or four minutes and realized that nobody had any idea what I was talking about. Hmm. And so I shut my notes and looked at them and just went, Wow, you know, have you never even considered what the, the, the Bible says about a musician or musicians? And they, they really hadn't. So that's when I knew I needed to write this book for them. That was five years ago, six years ago. So I'm finally, you know, I'm, I'm writing it now. It should be out in uh, early spring. So you'll have to have me back for that one. Absolutely. So now, when you talk to these guys, are you able to bring out uh, some, some Torah based concepts to, they, to sort he, of introduce them to these things? Absolutely. So, because there's a, you know I'm there all day long every day it's like mm-hmm. four or five four days or so and there's men and I'm doing mentoring sessions where you know bands come in to pick your brand industry experts brain and it gets you know there's been a lot of it's in, in my sessions people are being delivered <laughs> we're casting out <laughs> demons it's very That's great yeah <laughs> it's very <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> It's very interesting, uh, and so when as we're in, and, and of course there's mentor, during the mentoring sessions, uh, I'm dropping Torah based. I mean, everything about Christianity is is a Torah based concept or principle. I should they be. don't ne- right, and yeah. they, they don't necessarily know that. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a it's a wolf and it's a sheep in wolf's clothing. We're mm-hmm. being uh, you know uh, subversive about it. They don't actually, you know we're we're talking. To, it's like wax on, wax off. Mm-hmm. You don't actually know I'm teaching you karate. Same thing. <laughs> so where are you at in this book? It sounds very interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's. Well, like I said, I should have it done here in the next couple of months. It'll, and we're looking at an early spring release. Okay, okay. And it's talking. You know, it does. It, you know, it's. We're talking. I'm talking about the the responsibility of. It's not just for musicians. It's it's geared toward them. But this is what are the, what is your responsibility as a worshiper? What is your responsibility as a musician? Mm. Uh, what does the Bible? What does the Bible say? What is it actually saying in the scriptures about this thing? And Jesus said, you know, you're going to worship me in spirit, you know, and in truth. So where's, what does that spirit aspect look like? Well, Elijah used a harpist to get a word from the Holy Spirit. David played his harp uh, to cast the evil spirit out of Saul. 
um, the Levites played, 4,000 strong, you know, hmm. uh, under David. These, and, you know, God would come down like a cloud. They, it, it was so tangible, they had to, like, get, they had to leave either the tents of meeting with mm-hmm. Moses or the, the, the David's tabernacle because the presence of God was so thick that humans couldn't even be in the same room. That's powerful stuff. I mean, that's not stopped. Yeah. And people need to think, too, that a lot of, when they read the Psalms, that uh, yeah. these are, you know, this is for the harp and the lyre, and you know, there's, there's instructions right. that this is actually, uh, this is the words to a song. Right. Uh, you know, yeah. these are the lyrics. Yeah, and the New Testament says to sing spiritual songs. Hmm. It does say the word spiritual songs. What is, your, what is your favorite part of this book that's coming up? What do you think people really need to know? Is there one part that just, you know, I want them to get this out of it? I want them to get the understanding that their worship towards the Father in, in song, you know, right? Every church has music in mm-hmm. it, whether it's a, a woman on a piano or, you know, a contemporary band. There's music involved. Or a cantor even in a, in a Absolutely, synagogue, absolutely. Right? What I want them to understand is that there's a spiritual element to this and they need to figure out what that is and tap into it because it's mm. transforming. I mean, if it's, if it's you know, it, we're going to celebrate the fact that the Egyptian army was just wiped out. Moses, write this song, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's the song, the song of Moses is saying in the, in the, in the, in the throne room. Uh, look at what we have there with 24 elders. They're not necessarily human. Who are these guys? And then you got four living creatures. That for sure is not human. And they're singing. You know, they're singing the song to the lamb and the, the, the song of Moses. I mean, there's this, you know, and there's thunders and lightnings. I mean, there's, there's, this, there's a whole rock show going on. There is. And, and we need to understand that that is, that is inside of us. That dwells within us hmm. and, and, that, and it needs to come out. And we can change atmospheres. We can... Uh, lives are transformed through this. This is... Music is a huge part of the God experience, according to my Bible. And I want people to understand that because it will change their life. Hmm. It'll bring them closer to uh, a sp- the spirit- spiritual connection that we have with God. God is spirit. It says that. Jesus says, God is spirit. And his worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. It's true worshipers, I think, is the actual, literal, yeah. And, and music brings that out. Like you said, we, we and, yeah. it, it's so a spiritual look at how, barometer. Right, music is very powerful. Music can evoke smells from your past, your childhood. If you hear a song that mm. you don't recognize, that you heard like when you were three or four or five years old, it'll, you'll, it'll, you'll smell stuff that you smelled. Uh, it's, it's absolutely spiritual. It hmm. transcends our senses. Oh, amazing. Yeah. All right, well, we're talking about music. Uh, this thing is spiritual. Uh, so says Alan Aguirre. That's a new book coming out soon. And we're going to talk to him more right after this. Stay tuned. I'm going to interrupt again for just two minutes. That's all that you get to support this ministry. I want to tell you that these broadcasts are going out on international television all throughout Africa. They are now going out in Mandarin Chinese out of Taiwan. They're going out from Spain. They're going out from uh, Costa Rica, which goes out to the entire Spanish-speaking world. It's going out uh, Omega Television in Iceland. So many outlets that we are getting this message message out, and it's all because of you. We do not monetize this in any way, shape, or form. If it's going to be monetized, if it's going to be paid for, it's going to be done by those of you whose lives have been changed. Through no no coercion. I'm not promising you that you'll be flying a a, a new Learjet, or driving a Rolls Royce, or, or, circling the globe on a yacht. Ladies and gentlemen, we are doing this because the Almighty has asked us to do this. And if we're gonna be circling the globe on a yacht, it's because we're gonna be like Paul. We're gonna be doing what he, (laughs) he ended up shipwrecked on it, but in all that he did, he got the message out to the world. Whatever happens, ladies and gentlemen, is because we're obedient to the heavenly call and the Spirit is asking you to come. Get involved. Let a rude awakening happen in other people's lives as it happened in yours. Thank you for staying with me. Two minutes. 
And thank you for joining us again on Shabbat Night Live, and thank you for your support. And because of you, uh, we are able to talk about the spirituality of music, something we haven't really talked about on this show, but we are now because of Alan Aguirre. Alan, you are writing a new book. Uh, what is the title of it again? This Thing is Spiritual. This Thing is Spiritual, and it really is, and that might be surprising uh, to folks who know, if they don't know, they're going to know now, that <laughs> you had uh, the first Christian punk band in America? Is that that's, right? Yeah, that's what they say. I was 19, it was 1983, and yeah. And, and you were, yeah, so it's a Christian, and that might be yeah. a dichotomy to people, Christian punk. How can right. you have Christian punk? That so, doesn't equate for people. Right, so I get back to the States, I'm 19, it's 1983, and we, we started a ministry, ministering to the homeless street punk on Hollywood Boulevard. They're, you know, our age. Mm -hmm. uh, and younger and older, you know, so we, we found 14, 15 year old kids out there. So we started a street ministry, you know, loving on them and bringing them food and connected with a, a ministry, uh, a, a secular punk band in LA at the time called Circle One. The singer got saved and one of his friends owned a wig factory in LA that was an abandoned wig factory. So that, they started meeting there. So now we had a place to bring food and toiletries and things like that for these teenagers that were mm. living in the streets. Um, they, would, they would sleep in abandoned hotels. There was one called Hotel Hell, mm. uh, an abandoned hotel that, that a lot of them stayed in. And so I decided, you know what, Let's, it, this could be even more effective if we had a band to like front this ministry. And at that time, the only band in, in punk rock that had any sort of positive lyrical content were, was a band from DC called The Bad Brains. And I would get to eventually become very good friends with them. And this is one of the greatest bands <laughs> that ever existed. They were, but they were Rastafarians, which mm -hmm. is why they were talking about God and using scriptures and all that. So I wanted to do a punk rock band that had positive scriptural references or whatever, because anything about God is very negative in punk rock, and these guys were the only positive, but they're not Christians or Rastafarians, so we're gonna start a band that does that. And we called it Scattered Few, and we ministered to them practically with mm -hmm. food and, and you know toiletries and stuff like that, blankets or whatever, and we started playing around town, and that took off, and huh. it was, considered the, the first Christian punk rock band in the US. And so, uh, there you have it, the story. I mean, if people have been listening, it's your initial opinion of punk rock would be turned now by the positive influence that you had doing that. So th that right. really shows me that- Because I was a punk rocker before I got saved. Right, so you had that talent, you bring it over. <clears throat> right. And the uh, same thing with any, you've mentioned uh, previously P.O.D., uh, right. the band called uh, if anyone Payable on death. Payable on death. Yeah. San Diego band. Yeah, right. very, very positive. In fact, their, uh, I believe their song, um, Boom, that's what it's oh, called. Oh yeah, Boom. Boom. That became a theme for an NFL team. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah, and it was in a couple movies and stuff. Uh, yeah, very, yeah, They very just popular. put out a new record, their new single came out today, I think. Okay, very good stuff. So that just goes to show that you can't judge a book by its cover, and uh, right. it's all about the heart, as we were talking about before. What's your, what's your motive in doing things? Is it, is it, is it true? Then, then you will succeed, no matter what it is. Um, now, you had uh, another band uh, called Spyglass Blue. Right, so Spyglass Blue was my artier side. <laughs> uh, so, because where Scatter Few was this like intense thinking man, multi-dimensional punk rock band, Spyglass Blue was my artier side. Uh, <laughs> so it was kind of like an edgy new wave post-punk band, and that's the band that we played in uh, that what I mentioned uh, last time about the the bar in Lower East Side of Manhattan. That's the band that was. Okay, that's yeah. the band you're with and you're playing there. Yeah, I was with Spyglass Blue. Yeah. And when kids are st getting into these bands, you, you mentioned this uh, festival you have in, in Nashville every year, and these kids think. Yeah, the conference, yeah, yeah, the, the conference. objective. When they come to the objective and they, they want to put their foot in the door, um, is there any time you want to pull these kids aside and get, look. All day here, long. Here's the deal. My job is to break up as many bands as I possibly can. Really? Why? Before they kill them, they hurt themselves. <laughs> okay. You know, <laughs> they don't actually know what it is that they're doing. So if I can break your band up, man, I, I feel good. And, and that's <laughs> just for, even just for their spiritual health. But the, yeah, they're more, you know, more than anything, their spiritual health. I mean, why, 
I know what could possibly happen to their marriage or to their small little family. The fact that my wife and I survived this is, mm. is very rare. Uh, we just celebrated 30 years of marriage. That is not heard of when you work at this level. Uh, mm. The fact that my kids are all serving the Lord. Pastors can't even do that. Um, the fact that we're still a unit and we're a functioning family that serves God and, you know, and, uh, that's after going through all that, mm -hmm. there's no way. That's, we beat all the odds. And I would spare anybody that, that hard, hard challenge. Do you think there's any difference in that challenge between just the run-of-the-mill Christian kids and maybe kids who've been brought up in Torah and have that foundation? Or is it the same danger or same, same uh, folly no matter what? I think being grounded in the scriptural roots of our faith by keeping the commandments is going to take them further mm. than, than not having them. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I know there's, 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 there's passages in, in our Bibles that actually say that. Um, we're not tossed to and fro. Why? Because we're rooted in the teachings of Jesus and chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, we call that, you know, Torah on the top. Mm. You know, the, the Sermon on the Mount. If we're rooted in the foundation of God's commandments, I think we have a better chance of surviving. And I think that's why Christianity has that lack of long-term, um, uh, what's the word, longevity because they're not rooted in the foundations of the, of the word. They're rooted in Christendom, mm. which is an entirely different thing. They're, they're, they're rooted in the roof instead of being rooted in the foundation. I think so. And just trying to, trying to build all that up. If I could have instigated Shabbat earlier in my family, I know we would have bypassed a lot of nonsense. Mm. It's, I really do believe that. You know, if you take that to a, to a musical world, you know, and if you're going to obey Shabbat, what do you do when you've got a book or a, a gig booked on Shabbat? Right. So if I'm a regular, if I, so Ministries Walking is my prophetic worship band. Mm -hmm. That's different playing on a Friday or Friday night or a Saturday because we're ministering, True. and it's it's good mm -hmm. to do. You can do good on the Sabbath, right? Indeed. <laughs> there's, there's yes. That. Yes. But if it's a Spyglass Blue or Scatter Few thing, even though we're ministering, that's more of a like for a, a, a for profit type of band. Mm -hmm. I, so I think. That, that would be ordinary work. Right. Whereas the priests have double duty and it's not just considered profane on the Sabbath. Right, so it's, it's like going to work from nine to five or going to work at a soup kitchen on the Shabbat. Sure. It's two different things. I you're think ministering so. there and you're, yeah. I think so. Again, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not legalistic about any of this stuff. And I, I mean, I, I know people believe I am, but, mm. I, I, but I get it from both sides. I get it. From, oh, you're legalistic. To you're breaking the the, the Sabbath. Uh, you know, it's like you Paul. Win. Paul was getting it from both sides too. Yeah, yeah I can't. I can't win. <laughs> so you just do it anyway. But you. <laughs> <laughs> so you just do it anyway, and you got. Well, just... yes and no. I mean, uh, Ministries Walking is a ministry band, so mm -hmm. I I have no problem playing on a on a on a Shabbat or a feast day because we're ministering. Right. Whereas a scattered few or a spyglass blue is more of a for profit type of band. Speaking of for profit, so Yeshua w went in uh, just before Passover and took his whips and was whipping through the, uh, the tabernacle and you know don't make my house my father's house a den of, of thieves or or merchants or sure. whatever the translation is. So do you think that has happened to uh, the gospel? It's become a market instead of a message. I know you mentioned that phrase before. Right. So there was this. A necessary evil, and I say that because I had to be involved with it as a necessary evil. Not that I was, I didn't play by the rules, but there was this thing called the Gospel Music Association that was in Nashville for years. And they had a hard time, under, we, and so we were doing this objective thing alongside them, and they, uh, 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 their second to last year or something like that, they sat down with us and wanted to know how, it, what, it, what, it, what was it that we were doing to get the attention of all these people. And they had a hard time understanding that we were preaching the gospel to them. Because to mm. them, the gospel was a market. Ah. Right? It okay. wasn't a message, it was a market. And a year later, they shut their doors. Mm. Which I, I actually believe it was the, the Lord. Uh, well, I know it was. But it, the, the Christian music, you gotta remember, Christian music 
developed in the, the Jesus movie, Larry Norman, 1969, Ke uh, Phil Kage and The Way, Love Song, right? This was like godly, this, is for, this was God stuff. Mm -hmm. There was no market, there was no industry, you know? Yeah. Keith Green, like, you know, by the time Keith Green came around, yeah, there was already a structured thing, but still, you know, he's, he's free to, be, to do what he did and he did what he did. Man, by the time, you know, the 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, and then especially towards, uh, right before the 90s, or towards the end of the 90s, secular labels actually got in bed with Christian labels uh, as distributors, which was like, oh my gosh, we've been wanting, we've been hoping for this, we never knew this day was, would finally come, you know, to do that crossover thing. But that put a lot, of, that, that clamped a lot of stuff, because in order now, now you have to sell 25,000 units minimum, mm. just out the gate. So now that they're going to be really selective, it's going to make it harder for bands to get signed. They're going to get the flavor of the month. Whatever, whatever worked last six months ago is what we want to duplicate. So it really, it, it, I, I think it ruined yeah. music. Speaking of in that ruining, industry, it ruining music, you mentioned to me in the car yesterday we, at, at the airport, when I picked up at the airport, you mentioned that uh, you don't listen to a lot of Christian music right now because you... I, I've never something's ruined in it for you. I've very, I haven't listened to a lot of Christian music in a very, 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 very long time. I don't like it. Mm. I, I just I don't, I don't like the music. I don't like the style. And a lot of these people are my friends, and they know that, and they don't have a problem with that. Um, but there's a lot of music I don't listen to. I don't listen to a lot of secular music. I, mm. I listen to what I like, but I don't really listen to a lot of new stuff. So mm. when it comes to Christian music, that's why. My band Scatter Few was so popular was because we didn't sound like a Christian band. This was a secular band writing secular music, doing secular, competing against our secular counterparts in the Christian market. That set us so above the rest, and so that separated us so much from everybody else. And that's and they all know that hmm. we were the band the bands liked, the band the bands listened to, hmm. and if everybody was like Scatter Few, there'd be a whole bunch of them, right? I mean. So there's so it's it's been very difficult for me to like a lot of Christian music because I find you know it's been it's uh, it's so substandard mm -hmm. to the secular world. I know that's probably a horrible thing to say, but I've been saying it for thirty years, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm over it. <laughs> Flame mail him. <laughs> you know, Michael did this uh, series a while back, a couple of years ago, called the Rock and Roll Bible Show, and what his, he uh, he had a Bible study, uh, but it was centered around the stories of rock stars who had come to the knowledge of Yeshua, mm -hmm. and they wrote about it in their songs. Right. And mainly in the, in the, in the style and the era of music that he liked, uh, you know, the 60s. Like and, Bob Dylan. And, and so, yeah, exactly, Bob Dylan and folks like this, uh, who they outright sang about God. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, now, there's a, a band from the 90s. Um, my younger brother-in-law uh, listened to them. It was called Korn. Mm -hmm. Uh, corn spelled with a K. You can look them up, and they look they look pretty horrifying on <laughs> online. But but uh, something happened. You know that band, uh, or, or you know of them? I know a couple. Yeah. You, you know a couple of the members, and, and something happened in that band that that changed uh, one or more of the members. And yeah. just give that story. It's a very yeah. interesting story of a secular band that now is doing something that Christian bands aren't doing. Yeah, so I, I so the guitarist of Corn, Brian Head Welch, I believe he got saved around 2005, or, uh, on or around there, and so he 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 got saved. He left the band and he went underground. He went, you know, disappeared. Uh, when he resurfaced about two or three years later, he showed up at one of the festivals that we worked with, and at the time I was doing like their vidcast for them, and so they had they wanted me to be the liaison and. Um, and so I got to meet Brian, and he had, you know, a legitimate conversion. He was like two or three years into it now. He was, you know, on fire for the for the Lord, and and then um, his bass player in Corn got saved. So now they they've got at least two guys, possibly a third, that's like a bona fide, born again, spirit filled Christian in this <laughs> crazy heavy duty secular <laughs> band. And um, so about. I'm gonna say about three or four years ago, a movie came out called Holy Spirit, I think, and uh, had Todd White was in it, and he uh, he's the, the dreadlock guy, you know that you know those dreadlock guys. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, I think I know one. <laughs> yeah. uh, in my past life. Now, so uh, so anyway, so Todd hooks up with Brian and Fieldy, the bass player, and they start 
praying for people at corn concerts before the show and after the show. I, I don't, first of all, I don't even get that. Who, who would want to be prayed for? What, like the, the, uh, the audience that is attracted to corn. They don't want who to would be come paid. to get prayer? Why would they even ask for such a thing? I don't even understand how that works. Well, it's called evangelism. <laughs> <laughs> so they would, they would physically they would go out get and they into would... The, they would get into line. They would, they, okay. would, they would come out from backstage uh -huh. and walk the line. I mean, everyone, oh, oh my gosh, there's Brian and Fieldy. You know? yeah. They don't know the dreadlock guy because he's a Christian guy. <laughs> But, you know, and they would walk them down and they would just say, hey, we're here to pray for you. We'd like to lay hands on you and pray for you in the name of Jesus. If you want prayer for healing or whatever, come over here. And people started going over there. Before and after shows, they're praying for people. Now, something has really gone upside down when it's corn <laughs> praying for people before and after shows and not your Christian bands. Because Christian bands don't do that. That's crazy. What? I know. So uh, th their, their lives, have you, have you gotten to know these guys after, after this happened? And have you, have you talked to them? Are they, what, what's their, I mean, what do they do now? Because there's this, now there's this, okay, great, we've got this band with this uh, reputation right, from so, the past. So what do they do with this? Well, so Brian left the band for, for, a, few num for a few years. And then he went back to the band, and that's why this is happening now inside that band. Mm. Um, he's he's very he's written a couple, two or three books. He's involved. So Sonny from POD, the singer for POD, started a thing. Uh, he started a, a group called the Whosoever's. It's kind of like a it's a ministry. Started a ministry called the Whosoever's around 2009, I believe. With uh, there's a there's a Calvary Chapel pastor in Southern California called Raul Reese. His son Ryan, so uh, was a professional skateboarder type of guy and all that. So Sonny and Ryan started this thing called the Whosoever's. We were a part of them as ministries walking back, you know, 2009, 2010, whatever. And then they they brought Brian under in as well as well as well as a, a motocross professional, uh, uh, Feist, uh, Ronnie Feist, I believe his name is. So through the Whosoever, uh, the Whosoever is doing some amazing things in the public schools of, of Southern California. They're having these huge lunchtime rallies for Jesus in mm. public schools awesome. in Southern California. I love and it. And kids are getting saved. It's like amazing. So Brian's been involved with the, with the Whosoever uh, for, you know, for what, eight years now. And he, you know, he's, He's written some books. He's very, very vocal about his faith. He's mm. grown a lot. It's, uh, it's, it's been really fun to watch and see. Of course, you've got naysayers. Oh, well, he went, he's, he's still wearing makeup, and he's, you know, he went back to corn. You know what? Why are you judging another man's servant? Mm. That's the way he gets in there. You know, we forget that Yeshua you hung out with, hung out with the, the, uh, the prostitutes yeah. and the people that, Pharisees tossed aside. He came eating and drinking. Yes. God forbid. <laughs> so, you know, you can have ministry anywhere you go. And, and We're supposed to. I mean, yeah. how else are we supposed to impact the world around us if we're not engaged? And that's the problem. We're, we haven't been engaged. We're, we're afraid of the world. And we hide under, behind, uh, be of the world but not of it. That's not what that's talking about. You know, we're judging the world. We're not supposed to judge the world. We're supposed to judge the household of faith. Don't judge the world. They're not under the same contract. We have been, I have been actively involved with my secular reality from the very beginning. As soon as I got back to the United States, I was out there in the street. And I'm not do, saying that to do that. I'm just saying this is how I understand our faith to be. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting that, you know, when was that? 1983 was a long time ago. What was that, 35 years ago? And we're still straining on the net of, he's got earrings mm -hmm. or something. Regardless of their fruit or regardless of their testimony, regardless of what they're doing in the name of Jesus. And they're doing good stuff in the name of Jesus. We'd, it's a lot easier to jump on the, on the side of, uh, of seat of judgment and say, he's not doing it the way I think he should be doing it. Well, that's a mm -hmm. religious spirit. I'm not interested in religious spirits. No. Fear not, I have overcome the world. Right? Yep. Yeah. 
Alan, thank you for being yes, here. It's been my a pleasure. lot of fun. Absolutely, great, my pleasure. Great series. Uh, again, if you would like Alan's book, it's called The Feasts Unlocked, and you can get it at planetbluemedia.com. Enter the code RUDE15, and you can get 15% off for a limited time. Uh, so, again, thank you again to Alan Aguirre for joining us here on Shabbat Night Live. We'll see you next week. Shavuot Tov.